Welcome. Welcome to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. This is the last installment of A Blameless Life. And yeah, I've got lots on my mind. We'll see what ends up coming out of my mouth. I think that sometimes we can get caught in this limited idea of meditation, right? Like what we're doing is like this time sitting full lotus in some serene, super quiet environment. And, you know, if you live in the city, that's not what's got, what's up ever. It's not what's going on, maybe for a moment here or there. And then certainly if you're engaged in your life, if you're you know not in formal meditation, that's definitely not what's happening. And we can still be mindful. We can still be present. And as we're more present, we're more skillful. It's just naturally what happens because we taste the result, the residue of the impact of our actions of body, speech, and mind. We become more aware of what's happening. And of course, we're not always aware. We're unskillful. It happens. It's life. It's human. Right? Oops. And what if it's all just, oops, you know, like I made a mistake. And then we clean up the mess. Right? It's not oops, and then we just keep going on about our business. You know, it's not an apathetic kind of thing. It's present. Like, oh, yeah, shit happens. It's going to happen. You know, you're alive. You're going to cause suffering. You're going to experience suffering. Like, you can't avoid it. That's the reason is the first noble truth. And I always want to say bitches, like, somehow when that comes out of my mouth. Like, like just, like, it's really significant that the first noble truth that the Buddha offered is dukkha, unsatisfactoriness, discontent, suffering, dis-ease, you know, ill at ease. It's like, shit happens. And we spend so much time, I don't know, maybe you don't. I think that many of us do, or if not all of us, but trying to avoid suffering, avoid dukkha. And you know, if your habits are at all like mind, that behavior can get focused externally. You know, trying to make her be different or him be different or them be different, it be different, like good luck. We and this moment and these people are all arising due to some causes and conditions that have already happened. You can't be different than you are in this moment. This moment can't be different than it is. It's like this. But the next moment, that can be different because you can have agency. You can inform that next moment. Right? And when you make a mess, if the next response is to clean it up, you can kind of feel a little bit better about yourself because you engage in a wholesome act. And you don't have to just sit there spitting about the thing that happened, the mess that you made, because you're going to make a mess if you're alive. And so is everybody else. And sometimes we bump up against their messes. bigger mess than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> and then the floor gets a little cleaner. I don't know what kind of environment y'all grew up in, but the house that I grew up in was a disaster from lots of perspectives. It was a house. And, you know, my mom did own it. The bank owned it mostly, but she paid it off before she died. But so I had a house. We had a roof and electricity and gas most of the time. I mean, it was not gas, it was oil, but whatever, you know, there was hot water most of the time and the lights were on. But wow, was it dirty. <laughs> it was so dirty. <laughs> My mom was a sculptor and her studio was on the third floor of the house. And so all of the debris from whatever she was making would filter its way down. And it was an old Philly row home, so there was lots of like cracks between the floorboards. And so it just, 
you know, it was filthy. And so when something was spilled in the kitchen or the adjoining room, which wasn't very separate, but you, know, you could call the dining room if you wanted to, something was spilled in there. I remember it more in that space where the table was. My mom would clean up that little space where the thing was spilled. And so you have like a patch this big that was clean. It's like, okay. But if that's all we can do, it's better than if we didn't do that. You know, that can be enough. It wasn't her strength. She had other strengths and she had other failings, just like me, just like you. We have strengths and failings. If we don't have to then shit on ourselves for them, then we can clean them up and life goes on. It's like, oh, I don't know. I don't know about you. I mean, yeah, I don't know about you, but I know for me, like when I clean up something, you know, maybe a little, like a little 10 step action for you 12 steppers out there. You know, I clean up something, I feel cleaner. I feel lighter. I feel better about myself. And I notice that when I'm more present, sometimes what can happen is that there's more seeing of the mess. And at first we might think that we're messier because we're seeing the mess more. But sometimes it's just that we're more present. And if it's not seen, it can't be cleaned up. It just continues to operate under the radar. So some of you know, not everybody, but my mom died a year ago. So today is October 17th, 2024. And my mom died November 23rd, 2023. And so I'm in the first anniversary of her, of her death. And I was with her for those two months as she was dying. And her birthday was September 24th. She was born in 1947. So she would have been 77 a month ago. And in this period of time from September 24th, 2024 until this moment, and I think expecting will continue until November 23rd, who knows? I'm sure it's not gonna have like this harsh, like clean starting and stopping time, but I'm in this anniversary. And one of the ways that, has, that it's been showing up is my old habit energies are showing up more of feeling like I can't do anything right or that I'm a failure or like different manifestations of that. And some of times like, around her birthday, I remember it really sucking me in and down. But in the most recent wave of it, and it's been coming and going, it's not been constant. In the most recent wave of it, I had this real appreciation of seeing it. It's like, oh, I'm seeing it. And I could feel this increase in the depth of my practice, like a deepening of my practice or like a broadening of it. Like I can hold more now, I can hold more. And because my practice is strengthening or deepening my practice, we're not gonna get into the not to not self stuff tonight, but it's not my practice. It's a natural unfolding of practice, just being experienced by this amalgamation we call Augusta Hopkins. But as that practice is deepening, the stuff can get seen more. And when it's seen, there's the possibility for freedom. When it's not seen, it's just consuming you know, you're, you're just kind of down in it, but you can you can get up out of it or it passes because everything's impermanent, right? And Nietzsche. But the scene of like, oh, right, this is a conditioned experience. This was a coping mechanism that I developed growing up with a daily drinker and a daily drinking mother and a bipolar father, right? Like it was mayhem and I couldn't possibly blame them because I was an infant and I needed them. So I blame myself. And these days, when I notice this thought, and I, I saw it today, you can't do anything right. Like I noticed the thought arising. I could see that just preceding that thought, I was trying to control something. There's no mind to control. You know, it's like trying to do something perfectly. It's like, oh, right. 
And the scene of that, it just brings complete freedom. It's like, oh, right. And it's gone. Just drops away, falls away, fades away. And it's a natural unfolding of practice. And a foundation that can be supportive for that is the practicing with the five precepts, which is what we've been exploring these five sessions. And tonight being the fifth session, the formal theme or topic for tonight is the fifth precept, which is I undertake the training to refrain from consuming substances which cloud the mind and lead to heedlessness. And for me, the translation of substances which cloud the mind is so helpful because the things that can cloud the mind are so broad. It's not just drugs and alcohol. But it's all kinds of stuff that can make us squirrely. Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, almost anything on the internet or on the phone. Oh, the next hit from, from like refreshing and oh, someone else texted you or whatever. It gets the mind clouded, distorted. Our perspective gets unclear. But to know that, to know that it's distorted, that can bring freedom. And to know that my perspective was distorted because of that childhood environment, it's like, oh, of course. There's freedom and spaciousness of that. I don't have to take it personally. I didn't do it, it's not mine. And here I am impacted by it. And so to choose, what are we consuming? And maybe it begins by starting to get curious and to notice how am I impacted by that consumption? The sugar, the alcohol, the caffeine, the too much screen time. Like, oh, well, how am I impacted by that? And how am I impacted by being outside, getting my beautiful walk on the great highway, getting in a swim or surf or hanging out with the dog or petting the cat? Like, how am I impacted by that? and noticing for our own selves in this moment, what's nourishing for me. And then seeing if we can create more time or take more time to do those things that are nourishing and less of the things that are not nourishing for us. Sometimes I, I think for me, the thing that's the most difficult outside of myself that I consume is definitely stuff that comes in through technology. Because that stuff is designed to make me, make you, make all of us just keep going more and more and more. I need a little bit more, I need a little bit more, I need a little bit more. Like that just feels awful. It feels awful. So it can be hard for me to interface with technology in a way that's supportive. Maybe there's a Dhamma talk that I want to listen to or watch or a guided meditation I want to receive from one of my teachers. And then there's the next thing that just sucks me in. Or maybe something else sucks me in before I even get to listen to the thing I open the phone up to listen to. Let's enjoy the bells. Resting into your body. If it's supportive to close the eyes, allowing the eyes to close. And receiving these words, noticing resonance and dissonance, noticing how the heart, mind, and body receive these words from the Plum Village community of engaged Buddhism. A take on the fifth precept or the fifth mindfulness training. So 
So as I mentioned, the fifth precept is most often offered as I undertake the training to refrain from consuming substances which cloud the heart mind and lead to heedlessness. In the Plum Village community of engaged Buddhism, the fifth mindfulness training is offered as nourishment and healing. There's often in the Plum Village approach a way of looking at expanding beyond what am I choosing to not do? What might I want to practice to do? Aware of the suffering caused by unmindful consumption, I am committed to cultivating good health, both physically and mentally, for myself, my family, and my society, by practicing mindful eating, drinking, and consuming. I will practice looking deeply into how I consume the four kinds of nutrients, namely edible foods, sense impressions, volition, and consciousness. I am determined not to gamble or to use alcohol, drugs, or any other products which contain toxins, such as certain websites, electronic games, TV programs, films, magazines, books, and conversations. I will practice coming back to the present moment to be in touch with the refreshing, healing, and nourishing elements in me and around me. not letting regrets and sorrow drag me back into the past, nor letting anxieties, fear, or craving pull me out of the present moment. I am determined not to try to cover up loneliness, anxiety, or other suffering by losing myself in consumption. I will contemplate interbeing and consume in a way that preserves peace, joy, and well being in my body and consciousness, and in the collective body and consciousness of my family, my society, and the earth. Noticing how that lands, just too many words, doesn't really land, or maybe a particular sentence shows up for you. Just now, as I was reading it, the sentence that wanted to be repeated, is, I will practice coming back to the present moment to be in touch with the refreshing, healing, and nourishing elements in me and around me. And it goes on to say in the same sentence, not letting regrets and sorrow drag me back into the past, nor letting anxieties, fear, or craving pull me out of the present moment. I'm gonna riff on the first half of that sentence a little bit. But first, I want to say that, you know, this first half of the sentence is a way to tend to and care for the second half of the sentence. Like, we're going to have craving and greed, right? So if we, if we do this, coming back to the present moment stuff, the result of that is that regrets and sorrow don't drag us back into the past and anxieties and fear or craving pull us out of the present. And what's the practice? to practice coming back. So already that coming back, it's like, oh yeah, we're gonna lose touch with the present moment. Like this body's always here in the present. You don't get to be somewhere else. 
but sometimes the heart mind isn't here with the body in the present. You know, we're spinning out about something that we did in the past or something we have to do in the future or something someone did or said or that way they looked at me or our conditioning from whatever thing. It's like, good, we get to spin out on that sometimes. Okay. But we notice. And in the noticing already there's presence. Because when we notice that noticing's happening here. So we can appreciate that. Oh, oh, look at that. I noticed that. I caught that. There's presence. There's presence here. So coming back to the present, coming back to the present moment. And when we're in the present moment, we can be in touch with the refreshing, healing, and nourishing elements in me and around me. Because they're already in you. But if we're not here, we can't notice them. And we're out there trying to make that other thing the way we want it to be that's going to make us feel better. And if you've done that enough and paid attention enough, you notice that it doesn't really work. It just doesn't. You know, maybe for a moment when that person does that thing you want them to do, you feel better for a second. Maybe. Or maybe you realize that you've manipulated, manipulated the situation, then you feel bad because you manipulated the situation. I've been having more of those moments lately. And maybe you have a moment of easefulness. You're like, oh, it's okay. We can do that on Wednesday or Thursday. Either way, it's fine. And there's space for it to unfold. I'm going to give that to you again, and then I'd love to hear from you. I will practice coming back to the present moment to be in touch you gotta touch it to be in touch with a refreshing healing and nourishing elements in me and around me if you're alive there are some refreshing and healing and nourishing elements in you and around you but can you touch them right mostly we just miss them take them for granted Yeah, so I look forward to hearing from you. Thanks so much for your attention.